Hello and good afternoon. Uh, my name is James Gerald and I am um, going to talk to you about podcasting in education. Uh, before I come on to that, I'm just going to share a few things about me. I'm head of computing at Daveney School in Beaconsfield. I'm a CAS community leader, NCCE facilitator with computing at school, and um, I have to declare an interest. I uh, have a um, audio production business uh, that I run outside of school. Um, so my interests converge on this particular topic where I talk about podcasts in education. Um, okay. So uh, the uh, title of the, my presentation is about podcasting in general in education. Um, I know that the title is slightly different uh, um, to the build one. Um, what I'm going to cover today is uh, why you could podcast in your school, how to plan one, how to create one, how to deliver one. Um, and I have some examples of uh, teachers around the UK who have been doing this successfully. Um, so planning a podcast will be uh, looking at the content, who the audience is, the platforms you could use, the recording technology you could use, and team dynamics and how to put a team together. For creation, um, looking at how you can edit, using a microphone technique, uh, creating interludes and music for your podcast episodes. And for delivery, um, the frequency that your podcasts could go out at, um, taking in feedback and looking to the future. So I'm gonna start off with why you might want to podcast uh, in your school. Uh, so start with the why. Um, and uh, just, in case you were interested or you weren't sure where the word podcast has come from. Um, it's a mixture of um, broadcast and iPod, those two words. Um, so originally, um, I think you would probably have podcasts being listened to on Apple devices. Um, and obviously you can listen to podcasts on any MP3 player or any digital device that's connected to the internet these days. Um, so, the fact that these uh, that podcasts can be listened to on portable devices such as smartphones means you can do a range of things uh, while you're listening, like commuting, uh, doing washing, um, <laughs> cleaning, cooking, and you can still access brilliant podcasts and you can listen while you do something else. Um, and ultimately, um, you can you can make education even more accessible. So, um, again, with the why, um, I thought it might be good to just share some statistics with you from um, Ofcom's UK podcast survey, which they did in um, 2021, earlier this year. I think it was April. And uh, they just had a few interesting stats that I thought would be relevant to podcasting in education. Um, so, one of the questions was, which best describes a podcast? Um, 33 percent of people said um, that it was a series of audio programs about a particular topic. So that gives you an idea of the kind of things people would expect when they come across a podcast. Um, and 25 percent of respondents said it would be a short speech based audio uh, piece that I can listen to at my convenience. So you may be, for example, watching this video. Uh, having been recorded at your convenience, at your leisure. Um, why would you say you listen to a podcast? So why would people actually want to access a podcast that you might have made? 21% of people would listen to it for practical advice. And 52% of people would listen to a podcast to learn something new and improve their own skills or knowledge. Um, and the types of podcasts that people listen to uh, 54% of respondents said it was for education. Incidentally, the highest uh, category from this poll was comedy. Uh, so uh, I think that was somewhere in the 70%. So um, 
people that take action as a result of listening to a podcast. Uh, what did they do? Well, 48% of people researched more about a topic that was discussed in a podcast. So they do their kind of own further learning on it. And 35% started following someone on social media um, that featured in that podcast. Um, and 79% of people agreed with the statement, I feel more informed because of podcasts. So we're getting, I think, a general thread of the purpose of podcasts and why you might go about creating one. Um, it, it is information and learning, self-development and communication. So uh, in terms of pupils, we've got these educational benefits for why they might uh, create a podcast. So this is podcast creation. These are just some of the skills that um, pupils could develop. Um, and on top of these, you've got things like active learning um, to reinforce a concept that they've learnt. Um, it's easy to do, it's quite time efficient and doesn't require too much equipment. And of course, um, podcasts are rising in popularity. So they're becoming a more and more popular medium, medium for people to access learning and development. For teachers, um, again, this is just a, not a comprehensive list, but just some thoughts. Uh, here are some skills that might be developed if you are a teacher developing a podcast with or without pupils. You might be doing it as part of a senior leadership team uh, project or similar. Um, it could act as part of teachers' CPD. It could be part of um, your, your objectives as a school. And um, it, podcasting could be used as a way of disseminating information within the school community and sharing with other schools. Um, sharing ideas. Um, so I think this is, oops, gone one too far. I've got a bit of a delay. <laughs> so um, I like this uh, idea for the school community, podcasting opens new ways of communicating with others. And ultimately, I think that's what podcasts really do achieve rather well. Um, I just wanted to share with you um, the NCCE scheme of work on podcasts, which is a year four uh, unit of work. Uh, it's fantastic. It's comprehensive. It takes you through the, the process that I've, I'm touching upon, which is uh, from concept to uh, delivery. Um, and uh, here I'm on this video, I'm just demonstrating just how many resources there are available. You can see that there are uh, six lessons there on um, creating a podcast with the year four group. Um, and there's PowerPoints and accompanying um, documents and rubrics and the lot. Uh, so I highly recommend uh, the NCCE scheme of work for podcasting and indeed all of the NCCE schemes of work, which are all free. Um, and you can download and use at your leisure. Um, so on to the how. Uh, so uh, in my uh, work with uh, as audio shorts with my clients, um, one of the main questions I'm asked is, I really want to make a podcast, I really want to do a podcast, um, because I know that they deliver high impact, I know that they can be really popular, but I just don't know where to start. Um, so this is, I think, very common. If you're thinking that, then you are definitely not alone. And I think this is, you know, nothing to, you know, be worried about or concerned about. Um, it's, it's knowing where to start that's, that's crucial. So I put together some essentials, some nice to have, uh, some suggestions for recording software and podcasting platforms, as well as a uh, suggestion for publishing podcasts as well. So that's what I'm going to go through now with the how. Um, I think essentially you really do need a microphone that you can speak into that will record your voice, otherwise you won't have any sound for your podcast. Um, so various schools have done this. Um, 
in different ways. So you could have a laptop and you could be speaking into the microphone of your laptop, which I'm doing right now, and uh, judge the sound quality <laughs> as you wish. Um, other people have spent one pound on a microphone that they've bought cheaply on Amazon, and it's a um, 35 mil jack, like a earphone plug. Plug it into the side of your device, and then you've got a microphone that you can hold and speak into. Um, with microphones, what's really important is that you find where the pickup is, and the pickup is the, essentially the component of the microphone that takes in the sound, um, and you want to uh, position the pickup so that um, it is slightly below your bottom lip. What you want to avoid is the plosives and the air being pushed out from your lips to go straight into the pickup of the microphone. That's where you get the horrible, uh, boomy, um, plosive sounds really coming out in a horrible way. Um, it depends on the type of microphone. There are different patterns of pickup. So some will just pick up the immediate area in front of you. Others will pick up the whole room, um, omnidirectional. Um, uh, so others are kind of like shotgun uh, patterns, which you need to be very close up to, kind of things that DJs use and doesn't pick up any extraneous noise. So it's worth knowing the kind of pickup and the shape of the pickup pattern so that you know where to position yourself in relation to the microphone and how close you need to be. Some pickups are really, really uh, sensitive, others are not. And uh, knowing how the mic works is, is going to be extremely important. With really, really sensitive microphones, you could have them underneath your chin at a slight distance from your face. Um, and that way you're trying, you're avoiding as much as possible the breath from your uh, mouth getting into the microphone. Um, the way that you hear your own voice is through your own ears and the vibrations in your skull. And when, that's why when you hear your voice back, um, often you don't like the sound of it because you're not used to you sounding like that. Um, so it's also worth maybe recording yourself and listening to, your, listening to yourself back so that you know how you sound. Test the microphone out. Um, so there's a bit of mic technique there and also try and find a, a place for the microphone to be where it can be static, not move around. Uh, so a microphone stand may well be something that's really important. A microphone stand could just be something that you find on your desk that you can put the microphone on. It doesn't have to be a stand that you buy from a shop. Um, however, if you are using microphones with XLR cables, it's definitely worth getting a um, stand with possibly a shock mount that's going to uh, not um, interfere with the pickup if it gets knocked by accident. Um, so you could go from a budget of 20 pounds all the way up to a budget of 200, maybe even 2,000 pounds if you wanted to. Um, cables, uh, there are um, XLR cables for higher performing mics. A lot of people tend to use USB cables. There are lots of USB mics you can get. Um, my advice with um, types of connection is if you are using USB mics, then you can plug and play into most uh, laptops and computers, so that's quite handy. And with XLR cables, you will need an interface which will be um, a kind of middleman between your microphone and your laptop or computer. And the interface can cost um, in the double figures, maybe the triple figures. And the interface is a kind of a way of connecting your XLR to your USB. Um, and the other thing with microphones, of course, is don't be fooled by looks because a microphone's performance is dependent on the sound that it produces. Uh, you could have the best looking microphone in the world, but it's all about how it makes your voice sound. Um, so looks are absolutely not important when it comes to microphones. Um, at my school, we have blue snowball microphones. They look the business, they look the part. Um, then probably not the best sound quality for their price point. So shop around, look around, do some research. Please get in touch with me and ask me. I'm very happy to help. Um, 
if you just want to drop me an email or have a video chat, I'm very happy to talk through the options that you're looking at and help you with your solution. Um, the trick is, I think, to not spend too much money, but get the kind of sound quality that you're happy with. It does not need to be a professional sounding podcast. Um, uh, you're going to need a computer and on that computer will need to be some kind of recording and editing software and with the ability to put your podcast on some kind of podcast distribution platform, uh, which I'll come on to later. You can do all of this off an iPad if you have a fleet of iPads or if you have teacher iPads that you want to use. Um, but yes, you will need some kind of computer or um, handheld uh, recording device such as a Zoom H4n or a Tascam uh, DR05. Uh, there are lots and lots of handheld microphone solutions, uh, that's just two of them. Um, and a quiet room of course, so when I started recording in 2010 or something, uh, every couple of minutes there would be a class walking by and that would be picked up in my recordings and we'd have to do it again because I'm a bit of a perfectionist. Um, so a quiet room away from the rabble <laughs> of your school uh, would be a good um, uh, thing to do. So nice to have would be a pair of headphones so that you um, aren't distracted by other sounds around you and also so that you can hear your voice or other people's voice straight into your ears and we don't get mic bleed between mics if you've got more than one microphone. That can be a bit of a hassle in terms of editing. Um, a pop filter or pop shield will protect um, from some of those plosives and some sibilants that will come out of your voice uh, into the microphone and can smooth out the sound before you even need to do any editing. An audio interface which uh, goes in between your computer and your microphone, which again uh, you can put some uh, sound effects or sorry, some presets on your sound for if you already know that you want a bit of extra bass, you can just turn that up on your interface and some interlude music which will break up the segments of your podcast um, so that people know it's a new segment coming up. Um, here are just six options for recording. Um, these are not, this is not a comprehensive list, these are some of the more popular ones. If you have, um, if, if you're open to uh, Windows or Apple you can look at Anchor, uh, the Anchor app is available on the Play Store and the App Store. Audacity is available on Mac and PC and it's free, as is Anchor by the way. Um, GarageBand is available only on Apple devices but that's also free. Um, Hindenburg Journalist is something that is a paid one-off software platform and so is Logic Pro. Um, you can use Logic Pro on Apple devices. And Adobe Audition is web-based and is a paid subscription. You can choose monthly or yearly, but I believe. I, I know you can pay yearly because I have it. Um, so uh, publishing and hosting a podcast, there's Anchor again. Um, I've suggested Anchor for all three of these simply because it's free. It's uh, developed through Spotify. Um, and it's available on, on all sorts of devices. SoundCloud uh, is, is some way you can upload episodes and you can get play counts and things like that and you, it's quite easy to access. Um, Buzzsprout you pay for, so you get slightly more features and the features that you pay for with um, Libsyn and Buzzsprout are things like uh, stats and who's downloaded, you know, more in-depth stats about who's downloaded what and Libsyn in particular is quite good for uh, with one click distributing your podcast episodes to multiple different platforms. Um, so again it depends on budget but there's you know everything from the free anchor all the way up to paid Libsyn and they have different um, uh, what am I trying to say packages. Um, so if you want to just record and publish all in one, uh, it's free. Um, you can see that the video uh, towards the middle of the screen here is me just um, cycling through the options on the left hand side. So you've got these different colors here. Uh, all of these different options allow different features and uh, allows you ex uh, different flexibility with your podcast. 
so you've got library music, voice messages. You can collaborate with friends, add and upload music. Um, you can collaborate without needing to be in the same room. You can have people dial it into your podcast episode and leave a voice message, which can then be part of a segment. Um, and then it's all dropped into the episode builder that you can see on the right hand side and you can edit it fairly easily. Um, so you can see there's lots of music there, for example. <laughs> Um, and just moving on with the how, um, here are two different approaches that you could use for uh, developing, creating and developing a podcast. Um, you could have a group of digital leaders or digital champions or uh, digital trailblazers or whatever you <laughs> wish um, as pupils who are maybe led or supervised by a member of staff and those digital leaders will um, learn and develop their own podcasting skills. Or you could have a staff working group if this was something that was um, for parents or for school communities or other schools, it may be in a mat, um, or if it was just for leadership generally in schools across the country, primary leadership, secondary leadership, um, there's all sorts that you can do with staff working groups as well. So. As a suggestion, in these groups, they could allocate, allocate segments to each team member so that everybody has a particular role within the team and allocate a set time for each segment. So each segment is going to be one minute long. We're going to have eight segments in total. Um, and I'll come on to the different segments that you could have later on. And once written, these segments are written, um, they could present their segments to the rest of the team. It could be edited, tweaked, improved, and then uh, ensure that each segment runs to time, that it's concise and clear, and you could develop a rubric for this. Again, happy to help. Um, and then the team respond with feedback, uh, any questions, things that might have been uh, left out. Uh, which brings me on to part of the recording process, which is um, public speaking essentially and I just wanted to draw attention to School 21 and Voice 21 and the awesome public speaking resources available on uh, Voice 21. They are incredible. I have used them to, in part, I've used them to develop a speech cup at my own school um, and develop a speaking and listening framework. Um, absolutely brilliant. It's all freely available on the Voice 21 website. I highly, highly recommend uh, the Oracy um, materials. So moving on to what? So you want to do a podcast. Uh, you've got an idea of how you might go about uh, doing that podcast, but what's the content going to be? So again, this is another thing I get with my clients with audio shorts is they know they want to make a podcast. They know what they're passionate about, but they, I think it's quite common to get feel like there's a barrier there what can i talk about um this could be values led it could be you know what makes you tick what are you really interested in what are you currently learning about what kind of book are you reading that you want to talk about and share ideas with um but before we even go there it's a case of format so you could have a solo format with one person reflecting on their ideas or their advice or their experience um or you could have uh, a guest speaker with a presenter and you could have an interview type format uh, where you interview somebody who's a specialist in a particular topic um, and again this would work from leadership all the way through to a pupil who has a specialism I don't know um, indoor rope climbing uh, the French grades perhaps um, and uh, a group format so uh, you could have more than two people, two people, more than two people uh, discussing a topic together. And you can see, I think, by the time you get to the group format, the importance of forward planning and being really clear on what it is you want to achieve in the podcast. So publish with a purpose. Um, if you're doing this with pupils or even with, with, with staff or uh, adults generally, Listen to some BBC radio podcasts that are age appropriate. There are some amazing things out there. I've just introduced my year eight form to the Crypto Queen, which is a BBC 
podcast and it's all about cryptocurrencies and how um, uh, they can be a scam and this lady, the crypto queen's disappeared and they're trying to find her and where is she and how much money she walked off with. Um, so think about what's available out there through BBC podcasts and maybe do a critique of what they've put on their platform and how purposeful each of the podcasts are. So they all have a kind of niche, a kind of place. So what's your niche? What's your place going to be? What's your purpose? What's the aim, the objective of your podcast? Um, so this is a just a suggested cycle that you could use. Once you've planned your podcast in your group or on your own, you can then prepare your pod podcast and that could be you know, a whole written script that you're going to read from, which depends on who you are, whether that would help you, or notes that you can speak from. Um, and then you can produce it. And then I think the bit that some people either don't have the time to do or forget is promoting the podcast. People will listen to it if they know it's there. Uh, so <laughs> the, the key step is to make people aware of the podcast. This could be via school newsletters, any social media that your school uses. It could be uh, talking to the parents at the gate. Um, you could get all the parents in and talk to them about the podcast before it launches. Um, so there's all sorts of different ways that you can market your podcast. Um, choose a topic you're confident with that you can talk passionately and naturally about. Um, when you plan, plan several episodes at a time, record them in batches so that you're not constantly chasing your tail, have maybe season one, season two, so that you've got all of the episodes for season one ready before you even launch episode one. Um, don't necessarily script it word for word, but use a framework to talk around. You could use bullet points. Um, look at what other schools are doing, and I'm gonna take you through some examples in a moment. Um, and I would suggest uh, but this is only from my own experience of working with uh, my clients who are really keen to get people on board who don't realise that they need to listen to this podcast. Um, short episodes under 10 minutes is going to keep people's attention before they move on to something else. That will keep your content concise. Um, you could have regular episodes so that people keep coming back for more. You could... Um, uh, use uh, you could have a story that's in chapters and release one chapter per podcast keep people on the edge of their seats wanting more um, and develop a sense of interaction um, and again I'm going to come on to that later on so here are some ideas um, these are not um, again not a comprehensive list but just some ideas that um, I think could work if you were having pupils creating a podcast they could create class news, they could do a weekly roundup, and the target audience would be parents and other pupils, sports results, awards, timings, etc. I think target audience here is crucial. So for example, book reviews and book readings, your target audience is going to be parents and teachers, possibly some other uh, pupils as well. With class discussion, teachers and other pupils. Um, with a field trip, teachers and parents, with audio diaries, everybody, um, and with plays, parents and teachers. Um, so think really clearly about who's going to be listening, what kind of um, perspective they're going to be coming from. So uh, here are some things that staff could develop. So you could have a senior leadership podcast for a senior leadership team or aspiring senior leadership um, staff in schools. Um, and again, I mean, these, these bullet points are pretty self-explanatory, but you could have, uh, you could have a, a podcast for teachers um, where one teacher hosts, hosts it like a, a kind of teach meet um, setup where somebody says i've just used this brilliant resource or i've just uh tried out this brilliant uh approach in my lesson this week and this is what i've learned and you know i feel everybody should try blah 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 
so this could you could have podcasting as a platform to really champion great ideas and innovation in education among staff um, and with the whole school you could have study guides with revision techniques you could talk about metacognition um, and how that could apply across all of the curriculum subjects there's loads of stuff on metacognition nowadays um, uh, there's a whole range of pedagogical approaches always coming through and Cass has done some amazing stuff on that as well um, you could have pupils versus teachers it would be quite fun a kind of quiz style challenge um, you could talk about the history of the school celebrating the history of the school bringing the community close together you could have interviews uh, including with historical figures a bit like hot seating that you might do in lesson uh, a school newsletter and you could review curricular content and uh, tweak and improve develop as necessary or as needed so in terms of delivering a podcast um i think it's really important to keep it manageable look at your timetable is one podcast a week too much? Is one podcast per month enough? Uh, and as I said earlier, record them in batches, release them periodically, um, always have more than one in the bank that you haven't yet released. Keep ahead of yourself. Um, I think interaction is something that initially is quite hard to get right, but I think once you get that interaction and you get into the mindset of how to make a podcast interactive it could yield uh, incredible uh, results and participation and you could get more guest speakers on and you could um, expand your listenership that way um, you could take pupil and staff voice as entry and exit data in terms of feedback so you uh, could look at or analyze a certain area of the school uh, before the podcast and then depending on what the podcast aimed to achieve you could then do exit data uh, qualitative and qualitative and quantitative um, and then you could look at the impact that your podcast is having on your school community um, and i think uh, importantly uh, always be open to innovate change the format Look at what others are doing with podcasting in education. Uh, I may be experiencing network connection difficulties. OK. I hope not. You're coming um, through loud and clear, James. You, it's all lovely. good. You. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> Just a red message flag there. Good. Um, so um, always think about the future and how you can develop your, your podcast beyond um, what you're currently on, always look to be developing it, look at uh, ideas, what other people are doing. Um, so I interviewed a few people who have been podcasting with their school or as a teacher um, and um, got some really good insights from them and some advice from them that you might find useful if you're thinking of starting a podcast at your school. Um, so uh, I spoke to uh, the head teacher at Alderbrook Primary, and um, so if I just move this so I can see the quote myself. Um, so the way that he's done it is during lockdown, he used uh, lockdown as a catalyst to produce a podcast, and he lent on one of the parents who really knew what they were doing in terms of mics and recording borrowed an omnidirectional mic, um, uploaded his recordings onto Google Drive, um, sh shared them with the parent who did his magic. Um, and as a result, he's now looking to set up a podcast club. Um, but obviously, looking at how the restrictions are going to change things uh, in, in that way. But so I think this is an in, in interesting uh, message about using parents expertise if um, you know your parents best if if you think you can approach some parents about this or put an email out to your parents and ask for expertise to help get you started 
that could be one route into it. And there's a success story right there. Um, right. So um, I spoke to Shelley, who uh, until recently was deputy head teacher at Sudbury Primary. Um, C, um, I think, is a wonderful example because she now uh, she now runs her own business in recording. Uh, she does voiceovers and uh, she's worked with um, mental health. So I've written it down. Um, yeah, mental health foundation and city and guilds. So uh, I think Shelley is a, a lovely example of how you can turn something that you were curious about initially and wanted to get started. Um, into, into something that you can uh, do outside of school uh, with meaning and purpose. So initially, Shelley used YouTube to upskill herself. Um, she found coming up with topics tricky, as I've mentioned before. Uh, they had to be relevant for the pupils and keep them engaged. Uh, but she wanted the podcast to be separate from uh, their normal learning. Um, and to make it interactive, the school community emailed in with suggestions. Um, and you can see in her quote below, my technical and sound engineering skills have come a long way since starting the podcast. You've got to start somewhere, give it a go. The way we teach changes all the time. So this is a wonderful example of a teacher who's uh, except, you know, really embraced the way that uh, pedagogy's change, teaching approaches change, uh, technology is being used more and more and more these days. Um, and she re was reflecting on the podcast saying it brought everybody together, staff featured on it. And once you get started, you can change it. So don't be afraid to change it. And it was a, an opportunity for Shelley to promote the ethos and values of the school. Um, so uh, this, is, this is my school, uh, Daphne's school, a uh, member of staff called Sam Fryer is head of history and activities here and he wanted to start a podcast club i think partly because podcasts are on the rise and he wanted to uh, upskill himself with podcasts and that's what he's done he's thrown himself into it um and we had a chat about using anchor on the ipads because we have ipads here so he's used he's got year eights and uh, he's got a group of seven it's all child centered. So he's set them up with the app and he's allowed 35 minutes a week um, to pr start producing a podcast. Um, took half half a term to get up and running. So this is, a, I think, an important message about, you know, take the time to get your podcast up and running, even if it's just the first episode and, and make sure that you're happy with it and you understand it. Um, so he receives the segments. He edits each of the segments with the pupils and then he publishes it to the school Spotify account um, and yeah he does want people to bear in mind the length of time it takes to initially set the podcast up and he says because it's peer-to-peer -peer, the podcast is relatable the younger pupils are more likely to join in with the podcast and um, because it's my school I spoke to one of the year eight pupils who said the biggest challenge was giving the community more interactivity um, even though they did solve it in the end they expanded the podcast to be represented in a more interactive community application, Microsoft Teams. So they added questions and feedback as polls in Teams. Uh, so that's how they've made theirs more interactive. And this was on Anchor using iPads. Um, I also spoke to Shashi, uh, who's based up in Scotland. He's got a website and a podcast. And uh, so he was looking at integrating computational thinking across the curriculum as a problem solving strategy in all lessons and all subjects. Um, so he wanted to spread the word via a conversation around computational thinking using voices that weren't related to computing and wanted to see if teachers do understand computational thinking and what flavors of computational thinking they've used in their own context. How do they evaluate it? And when I spoke to him, he was saying a lot of the time teachers are using computational thinking but don't realize it um so that was quite interesting and he was he said initially we were finding our way in the dark um none of us had done podcasting before 
and the challenge was finding time to meet. Uh, so lots of this was done online. They used Google Docs for brainstorming ideas um, and they allowed themselves 30 or 40 minutes to record live and then edit afterwards. But um, again, a message here, which is uh, much of this could be done online if people can't physically be in the same room. You could be on Teams or Google Hangouts or uh, Zoom and you could be putting aside half an hour somewhere in your day to speak to your your podcast working group. Um, uh, so he was saying that it was only later on he learnt how to make it sound good. So it doesn't need to sound perfect. This is a recurring theme. <laughs> Um, you can only be so prepared for your first episode, which I think is an understatement. I think that's, that's pretty important. Just get it out there. Without structure and consistency, you won't have an audience. And that's if you're trying to grow an audience, of course, um, as, as he is. So what he did to create his podcast is he collected audio files from each person in the group, imported the audio files into Audacity, added an outro and intro, um, and then he recorded the meeting in Google Meet, edited it and published it. Um, for marketing, and this is, a, I think, a, a good example of excellent marketing, he's published his article in Hello World, which is how I came across um, Shashi. Uh, he's published it on the ECIS website by the French teacher. Uh, so he's getting it out, not just through um, computing channels. Um, and via Computer Science Scotland and the Computer Science Teachers Association. And he says his reach is getting wider and wider and his next step is student voice. So this is the innovation coming in. This is the evolving of the podcast into something new. Um, and Alan, uh, who I spoke to, who did this quite a long time ago, um, uh, what he did was suggest to a group of years seven to nine um, as part of their multimedia project that they recorded a small audio clip to feature in a podcast or radio show rather than hosting a regular podcast which could be seen as a bit of a crutch because then you've got to keep it going um, but this this was a nice project because it it fitted in with the, the a project that i believe they are already doing and so he gave them the theme which is online safety and ask the year nines to make something for year seven and eight. And the idea was to convey an online safety message in a two to three minute audio segment using drama and dialogue. And he put them in groups of three and gave them two hours a week. And he gave them a real life e-safety um, case study. I mean, it's real. So this was based on something that had actually happened. And Alan had... Um, I'm really sorry, just going to have to jump in, uh, just because I realised with time, we just wanted to get a couple of questions to you. Is that OK, just to jump in? Absolutely. There? I do want to yep. stop you with flow. Um, um, but that's I just want really to... Finished. I've only got two slides left. Go for it. That, that's, that's all right. No, brilliant. So um, I just want to come to some of the questions um, just um, towards the end here. So what publicly available podcast would you recommend um, as a great example for, for teachers? Uh, for teachers, so uh, on uh, there's an accompanying handout with um, this slide deck, which should be available to people who've registered for this. And on that handout, I've uh, uh, provided some links. So if I, uh, I'm not sure if I can open it very easily from here, but um, those uh, on the handout near the bottom, I believe, there's the NCCE podcast. There's uh, Hello World podcast uh there's a computing at school podcast um there's a the nah uh, the naht uh, national unit of head teachers uh do a podcast for leadership so i think when you start looking for specific things like that uh podcasts about computing podcasts about leadership you'll find that there's a wealth of materials out there but I have provided a, a short and concise list on the handout document of um, some teacher centric podcasts that could get you started in terms of the, the you know, listening to what it could sound like and what you could achieve. 
Great, thanks, James. Yeah, and those handouts are definitely available to everyone. You'll just see that in your uh, kind of expanded bar. Thank you. And then, James, just just to finish off, really, if anyone wanted to get in touch uh, for more details, um, uh, you've yep. got so much to share, as as we can see. Is what's the best way for people to get in touch on your slide there? Obviously, which I should have realised. So. <laughs> <No, it's fine. laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, I've read your mind. So I am on Twitter, and my Cast Teacher Hearts account is. Um, really um my computing at school stuff i also uh lead the beaconsfield hub so if you are registered on the computing at school website um and you search for beaconsfield hub or james gerald spellings there a bit of a funny surname um you will find my hub and you are very welcome to join it especially if you're in the area always welcome new members um uh so you could get in touch with me via Twitter or Computing at School website, or if you are uh, on Facebook, you can find my audio shorts page, which has got all of my uh, contact information for my audio shorts business. Um, and between, as a teaching community, I'm very, very happy to um, help people out with their podcasts for education. Um, obviously, you know, on a voluntary basis. Um, so. You know, I'm, I'm not going to start <laughs> uh, treating people like clients or anything. Um, it's a passion of mine um, and I'm, I'm really happy to help out. And I'd love to be part of people's, you know, journey to creating podcasts and realizing how much they love it. Great. Thank you, James. Uh, Tim, I think that's all the questions uh, from me. So I'm going to hand back over to you. Thanks very much. Um, I'm just going to do a little bit of summary, summary towards the end. I think your passion definitely comes across, James. So thank you so much for sharing so much insight. And I actually also hope that today's session has inspired many of you to think about um, podcasting uh, yourselves and, you know, um, how, and how you can integrate podcasting into your teaching and planning. And, you know, it clearly uh, what's really nice is showing, showing how beneficial it is for learning, um, you know, whether with your staff or your students. So. James, thank you so much. And um, Pete, thank you as well for your questions. Um, I just would say at the end of the webinar, there's a short survey uh, which will appear on the screen. Uh, we would be immensely grateful if you could take just a minute to complete the survey. And a recording of this webinar will be available imminently um, and also hopefully also on the CAS YouTube channel uh, pronto. Um, we've still got two days to go on the CAS Virtual Showcase. Um, so still a number of great sessions, uh, for example, five o'clock. If you're any of you are on Instagram, which I know some of you are, head over to Instagram on the, the Computing at School Instagram page because we're doing a, a live session uh, with people like Beth and Ware and Hayley Winter. If you're on Instagram, you'll know who these people are. Um, top tips on using teaching in early years. And then we've got sessions tomorrow on Microbit and Arduino. And um, the great Jennifer King from Microsoft is doing a, a session on the on their Explore the Digital Future on their digital future program, which I think is a really cool program. So um, get booking if you haven't done so. Um, James, thank you again. And um, that's us done for today. So thanks for joining. And thank you. Have a thank you and have a lovely rest of your day, everyone. Thank you and bye-bye.